transformation. Obviously a play on words of transformation, but the motion aspect is the idea that we're moving at hyper pace towards an unknown future. And today specifically, I'm going to be talking about how we need to evolve knowledge towards wisdom. And the future requires us to understand a new skill set. And this new skill set is what we're going to be unpacking in today's session. All transformations, no matter how small or how large, always start off with the sadness of leaving our old identities behind, our comfort zones and our old ideas of how we bring impact to the world. Add to that COVID-19, and we've had a mass traumatic experience as human beings. And the second stage of all transformations is strangeness, because all of a sudden, we are thrown into a new world that's really strange. Just a year ago, nobody had ever heard of an NFT. Today, people are paying $80 million dollars for NFTs, and we still, still don't even know what they are. And then eventually we get to adventure, but we are nowhere near adventure as yet. And as I'll show you through the cycles that we go through, that we still have a few more years until we get to that adventure. I'm going to share with you two cycles today. And I think it's important for us to understand that nobody can tell us what the future looks like exactly but we can understand the cycles that we're going through as humanity, and understanding these cycles gives us a better opportunity to prepare. The first cycle is a book written in 1996 called The Fourth Turning. This book was written by two gentlemen called William Strauss and Neil Howe. You might not know these two gentlemen, but you've used their language hundreds of times in your life. They are the gentlemen who came up with the idea of baby boomers, Generation X, Generation Y, and Generation Z. These two gentlemen did further research, and they brought out a book called The Fourth Turning. They brought this book out in 1996, and in it, they explained that humanity has been going through something called the saculum for hundreds and hundreds of years. What is a saculum? A saculum is an 80-year cycle, and humanity has been going through these 80-year cycles for hundreds and hundreds of years. And what they say is within these cycles, we have seasons. And these seasons are just like our seasons that we experience here on Earth. We have a spring, or as they call it, the high. We have a summer, or as they call it, an awakening. We have an autumn called the unraveling. And we have the crisis, as they call, as a winter that we are going through at the moment. And very quickly, I want to take you through these four stages to show you that we have been going through these stages without even realizing it. The last time an 80-year cycle ended was World War II, and a new cycle began in 1946. And for 20 years, we had all the new amazing things, like TVs, jets, United Nations, International Monetary Fund, and life was all about peaceful living. And after that spring era, we move into summer, or the awakening. And this process, from 1964 to 1984, we have this new awakening of who we are as human beings. Woodstock, Star Wars, and a whole bunch of other things showed us as human beings who we are and how we fit in to the universe. Summer is always followed by autumn. And the unraveling began in 1984 to 2008. And in this unraveling period, we start to see that many things that we once trusted start to unravel. The Exxon Valdez scenario created the green movement that we are in today. The feminist movement began over this period of time. We had the Berlin Wall come down, Chinaman Square happen, and we start to see these unravelings start to happen over this period of time. But before I show you the next section, let me just remind you, this book was written in 1996. And in 1996, what they said is that we're not going to make any predictions of what's coming. We're just going to tell you what happened in the last 80-year cycle, and we're going to show you what happened in the last 80-year cycle. And by that, we can see that we are going through a cycle whether we like it or not. And in 1996, when this book came out, nobody really paid much attention to it. But in 2008, as they had written, all of a sudden this book became very famous. And what they said in 1996, that we will have from 2008, the beginning of the crisis, the beginning of winter. And bang on the money, in 2008 we began a financial crisis, we have national divide and political divide, we have 
a lot of unrest, massive unemployment, COVID-19, and the war that has just begun. Remember that when they wrote this book in 1996, they were just telling us what happened in the last 80-year cycle. And what happened in the last 80-year cycle? National divide, political divide, job losses, financial crisis, and war, World War II. And so here we are, and we still have a few more years to go to close off this winter period, this crisis period. So that's the first cycle I wanted to share with you. But the second cycle gets us to understand how we need to evolve knowledge to wisdom, knowledge to intuition, because we need a new skill as we move into this future. And if you think that you are having a crisis of meaning, you're not alone. The whole world is going through a crisis of meaning because everything we once trusted all of a sudden is not really trustable, just like 80 years ago. But let's go back a few hundred years. And a few hundred years ago, the skills we required as human beings were very different to what they were 200 years ago and what they'll need, need to be as we move into the future. And this part and this cycle is called the paradigm shifting skills that we require as human beings. So if we go back down a few hundred years ago, we start to realize that in the agricultural times, the most important thing we could do was follow our forefathers. And in agricultural times, the most important thing we had as human beings was our muscles, our brawn and our body, because this was the tool that we needed to work in the fields for 16 hours a day to feed ourselves, take something to the market and trade and hopefully even feed the village that we came from. For hundreds of years, that worked, this worked incredibly well and saw us build cities and civilizations because of the agricultural period. But 200 years ago, things started to change because the Industrial Revolution began, and now all of a sudden, our bodies were replaced by factories. And what we needed to do was start to develop something new called IQ. And in this process of IQ, we started to learn all the knowledge required for left-brain, process-driven, outcome-based thinking. And it was this idea that really started to begin the Industrial Revolution. Follow the system, go to school, go and study, and follow the system and see yourself become incredibly successful. And for 200 years, this has made us really successful as human beings. But unfortunately, what has started to happen is we have arrived at something called the surplus society. And today we are in a surplus society. And let me read this with you. A surplus society has a surplus of similar companies employing similar people with similar educational backgrounds, coming up with similar ideas, producing similar things with similar prices and similar quality. This is the world we're in today. Commoditization has happened to pretty much every aspect of our lives. Just because you have a degree doesn't mean anything anymore. Just because you've been in business for 20, 30, 80 years doesn't mean anything more. Everything is becoming more and more commoditized. And because of this commoditization, we need to start realizing that a new skill set is required. Now, if you think back to 100 years ago, if you wanted to improve anything, what did you do? You added electricity to it. And we had a huge electrical revolution 100 years ago, and today we take electricity for granted. We can't even imagine our lives without electricity. But in today's world, the new electricity is AI, artificial intelligence and data. And everything in our lives will have AI attached to it, just like everything has electricity attached to it. Now, electricity took away the manpower that we required, and AI will take away the need for any sort of knowledge or IQ because it will be taken care of by data. Already, we have given all the power over to Google Maps to tell us where we're going, and slowly but surely, we'll give away more and more power to the AI. Already, we are letting AI choose the music that we listen to. We have AI that soon will be driving all the traffic that we'll be in, and we'll also have AI that determines what lighting we have when we arrive at home. So at every single touch point, AI will be affecting our lives. But as we move into this next phase of our reality, and this is why we need to think about intuition and wisdom as a new skill set, but in this new world, we need to realize that quantum becomes our new reality. We're moving away from the industrial age to the quantum age. In fact, I think the fourth industrial revolution is a bad description of where we're going, because where we're going is not industrial. It's quantum. It should be called the first dematerialization revolution that we're moving towards. And in this new world, we need new skills. And these new skills are called intuition, creativity, and fascination. 
Now, anybody here want to tell me what intuition is? Would you like to take a guess, anybody? Sir? Intuition? No? Most people would tell you it's gut feel, right? Would you agree with me? It's kind of a gut feel. You have an idea of what it should be, and you kind of take that as an idea of moving into the future using gut feel. But the problem is with gut feel is that often our gut feel is tainted. It's got traumatic memories in it. And so if you had a bad experience with a dog when you were four years old, moving forward into your life, you'll think that all dogs are dangerous, which is not true because that's just the memory that you've been carrying. So in order for us to understand intuition, I want to spend the next 10 minutes explaining to you what I think intuition is, because this is going to be the skill we need to evolve into as we move into the future. Remember that every touch point of our lives has electricity attached to it, we take it for granted. And in the next 10 years, everything in our lives will have AI attached to it, and we'll take it for granted. So when AI takes over making the rudimentary decisions for us, intuition becomes the key. So let's start off with what intuition is as a starting point. And as a starting point, the best way we can include intuition in our decision-making process is to start with the idea of wisdom. Now, the best way to describe wisdom, there's many different ways to describe wisdom, but one of the best ways is having memories with no triggers. You know, we are adults 90% of the time, and then all of a sudden we're triggered, we're having a tantrum, we're jealous, we're envious, we're upset, we're sulking. But how do we get past those? And the best way to get past those is actually to start healing our past, healing the trauma that we have been carrying around. And so Alan Watts describes this really well. He says, the knowledgeable man has to learn something new every day, but the wise man has to unlearn something new every day. And it's in this unlearning that we start to understand what wisdom really is. Dr. Joe Dispenza says, wisdom is having memories with no triggers. And we all have certain triggers. And we love being around people that are wise, that no trigger actually gets to them. Also, Tony Robbins says, moving from unconscious memories to conscious memories makes us wise. In other words, we don't blame our past, we thank our past. And it's in this process of reversing into going into our past and releasing what has been there and needs to stay there in order for us to recalibrate ourselves to move into this future with wisdom. So step one is wisdom. Step two is this idea of curiosity. But before I tell you about curiosity, I'm a huge fan of uh, Albert Einstein, and I'm going to use him a lot today because I think he's had way beyond his time and his years. And he says, a clever person solves a problem, but a wise person avoids it. And so we need no more clever people in this world. We need many more wise people as we move into this future. So let's think about the next step of intuition, the skill set that we will need for the future. The second step is curiosity, making decisions based on fascination and excitement. And you know what? School never allowed us to make decisions based on fascination or excitement. School told us to follow a process and we could become successful. In the future, we're not about sticking in, we're about sticking out. And this is the new currency that we'll start to need to have. And so, you know, we've always made decisions based on logic, the right thing to do. Or we've made decisions that we don't want to admit to based on the ego thing to do. And we all go through this process of making logical and ego-based decisions. And this one here is my favorite one. It says, I'll never choose a career path for my children. It's their responsibility to choose whatever medical school they'll graduate from. A Middle Eastern parent. I'm Middle Eastern myself, I know, because I had four choices growing up. I could be an accountant, a lawyer, a doctor, or a failure. And here I am speaking as a failure. But as a Middle Eastern, all our decisions are made based on what our parents told us to do. And all respect to our parents, our parents are not living in the future, our parents are living in the past. And so what we have to start realizing is that our kids require us to allow them not to make logical decisions because AI will take care of that. Nobody likes any ego-based decisions. What we need to start focusing in on is curious-based decisions. And it's this curiosity that we need to start exploring even deeper and even further. And all of us have a very unique signature of what makes us fascinated, what makes us excited, and what makes us passionate. 
And as we move into the future, we don't want to be part of the commoditized workforce. We want to stand out from this workforce. And in this new world, curiosity leads us to creativity. And boy, does the future require more things, more people to breathe life into something. We are bored of the same old, same old, and we're always looking for something more and more unique. And so this creativity becomes an incredibly important part of what we think about when we think about curiosity. It was Ros Eleanor Roosevelt that said it best. He says, she said, I think, at a, I think at a child's birth, mother could ask a fairy godmother to endow it with one most useful gift, and that gift would be the gift of curiosity. And we must realize that often we tell our kids it's okay to be curious, on the weekends. What we should do is follow the process in the week, and then on the weekends you can have curiosity. But if we do that to our kids, they become part of a commoditized future, a surplus of very smart people that doesn't really mean anything anymore as we move into this quantum reality. Let's go on to the third stage of intuition, something that we've never been celebrated for, imagination. If you were imagining something at school, you were told that you were daydreaming and you should get back into the books and start studying the books again. But really the truth is imagination gives us this opportunity to think about what's coming. And this idea of imagination, the reason that it hasn't been really celebrated is that our society is addicted to certainty. We often do things only based on an absolute outcome. We don't want to experiment. We don't have time for experimentation. What we want to do is we want to have an absolute outcome, and that's all we need to be doing so that we have an ROI on all of these decisions that we are creating. And the brain actually doesn't like anything that's uncertain. Anything that's unpredictable makes our brain sore. So our brains continuously look for absolute outcomes rather than a process of experimentation. In fact, UNESCO's Future Literacy Program calls this process and mega trend that we're going through as humanity a poverty in reimagination. We are more keen to hold on to the old world than we are to actually imagine what the future could be and the future that we're moving towards. And Einstein said it best. He said, imagination is everything. It is the preview of the life that's coming attractions. And this really changes our internal dialogue because when we have the process of power of imagination, we're able to move from where have I been, how has it been that I've been there, to a process of where am I going and how am I going to be imagining the next steps of actually getting there. So intuition is made up of healing our past, making decisions with curiosity, having the ability to imagine what's coming, and ultimately making this a reality when we start to experiment with all of these ideas that we have. And experimentation, again, is something that's never been celebrated because we've always wanted an addiction to certainty. And experimentation is the idea of doing things without the basics of outcomes. And imagination or experimentation is best described by the great scientist Claude Bernard. He says, observation is passive science, experimentation is active science. And so while we heal our past, make decisions with curiosity, experiment, what we're starting to do is bringing that into our reality and playing around with it. And so intuition becomes this new skill set that we will require in a future that'll be managed by data and AI. And so when we cultivate our wisdom, heal our past, when we make decisions based on our excitement and curiosity, when we can imagine what's possible and we continuously experiment, we start to develop a sixth sense, an intuition. And it's this intuition that gives us an opportunity to see patterns that we've never seen before. And it's in seeing these patterns that we've never seen before gives us the superpower of evolving into the future as unique human beings. And this is really the currency of the future. The state gives us a state of flow. And in the state of flow, what we have is the opportunity to be adaptable, to be optimistic, and to be flexible. And we are able to be optimistic when we look at the future. We now become excited about this fluid potential and possibilities of where we're going. And it's this idea that we need to stop and think about. The problem we have in the world today is best described by Herman Kahn, is we have the expert problem. And most, most of the world is ruled by experts of the world where we come from, and not the world we're moving to. And so the best way to understand this is read with me when I read Herman Kahn's words. He says, 
the more expert, or at least the more educated a person is, the less likely that person is to see a solution when it is not within the framework in which he or she has been taught to think. And so the world we have right now is trying to figure out how to squeeze the past into this future. And that's a very, very difficult thing for us to do. And so ultimately what we need to do is we need to move away from to-do lists and start to focus on to-be lists. And this idea is, who do we want to be as we move into this future? Who are we choosing to evolve into? Because this uniqueness that we have will become our currency. And so to-do lists keeps our heads down, to-be lists keeps our heads up, because that's what we're starting to aim to move towards. This is an emotional evolution that we need to be going through, not a mental evolution. We have done all the mental work we need to, and now we have technology competing with us in the mental ability, just like factories competed with our bodies in the Industrial Revolution. And when we decide who we want to be, the most incredible thing happens. We move from motivation to discipline. When you wake up in the morning and you haven't decided who you want to be, you'll need motivation every time your alarm clock goes off. When you've decided who you want to be, you now have the discipline to wake up five minutes before your alarm clock does. And this becomes the difference of sticking it with the old world or actually moving and evolving to become a more intuitive human being. And we don't quite realize this, that our personality actually creates our personal reality. And when we haven't evolved our personality and we only focused on IQ, our personality doesn't evolve. And then we blame everybody around us and our past for things not happening like we want them to. But meanwhile, we are the masters of our perspective. We are the ones who choose the personality we have to create the personal reality we move into. Because we don't often see things as they are, but we see things as we are. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever wanted to buy a car and all of a sudden you see that car everywhere? Who did that? Did BMW hear you or Porsche? Go, oh, that's the person who wants a Porsche. Let's put Porsches everywhere. Or what about that person you don't like and you keep bumping into them at the traffic light, at the grocery store, you're like, flipping hell, how do I get away from this person? What we like to do is take responsibility for the nice things in our lives. But the things that we don't like, that's not me. That was his fault, her fault, she did it, he did it, and they did it, but not me. And so this responsibility becomes for us to heal our past and make decisions with our hearts and to be able to imagine where we're going with more excitement more adaptability and more flexibility. Now, if we go back a little bit in history again, we know that the Black Plague in 1346 to 1352 devastated Europe. It took away two-thirds of the population of Europe and was an incredibly shocking process. But because of the death, the destruction, and the implosion of that society, we started to see the birth of something incredible, something that we still celebrate today called the Italian Renaissance. The Italian Renaissance was only birthed because of the death, the destruction, and the implosion of this old society. And in the Italian Renaissance, what do we do for the very first time? We had this new level of consciousness. And this new level of consciousness got us to celebrate beauty, knowledge, and art like never before. And guess what? We've had COVID-19, a devastating process to our world, and we are still dealing with it right now. But in the process of COVID, we had the death, the destruction, and the implosion of an old world. It fast-tracked 20, 30, 10 years ahead of time, working from home, remote working, having all these new things that we're expecting to happen by 2026, 2028, 2030. All of a sudden, we're here at 2022. But guess what? When we come out of this fourth turning, when we finish this Industrial Revolution chapter, we'll start to come into a new renaissance. And it will be this new renaissance that we need to start celebrating. And this new renaissance won't be about celebrating beauty, art, and knowledge so much as it will be celebrating our uniqueness and our genius. And it's in this currency that we need to understand that intuition becomes a superpower, a currency, a unique signature that all of us as human beings can bring to the party. And it's in this unique signature that we become successful as we start adding value to a world that will be run mostly by technology. And we all think that technology is this horrible thing that's gonna be an apolopic, apol, apol, I can't even talk today, a bad future. But really, future technology is neutral. We project negativity or positivity onto this technology. If you think about what technology can do to Africa, 
an eight-year-old girl in Malawi getting access to YouTube, educating herself, changing her village, her town, her country, and her continent, we have an incredible opportunity to bring about more transparency, more fairness, and more justice to the world using this sort of technology. So in order for us to evolve into this future, the first thing we need to realize is that it's not easy. Nobody said it was going to be easy. It's not easy healing our pasts. It's not easy letting go of an identity that we once had that was successful. Because remember, the best farmers in the world were irrelevant in the Industrial Revolution. The people that ran the best infrastructure for those farms were irrelevant when the Industrial Revolution arrived. And so as we move from the Industrial Revolution, all the skill sets that we have in this Industrial Revolution that's seen us to become successful will slowly but surely become irrelevant as we start moving into this quantum world. And we have a few more years to watch the end of this start to take shape. And so as I mentioned earlier, the crisis of meaning is this idea that we once trusted the politics around the world. We don't trust it so much anymore. It depends which news channel you're watching, and that news channel will give its own set of propagandas. We used to trust the dollar. We don't trust the dollar anymore. Two trillions of it has been just printed over the last 18 months. Education used to guarantee us success. Doesn't really guarantee us success anymore. And so everything at every touch point is starting to implode around us. And this is necessary for us to evolve into a new world, into this new feminine consciousness that's rising around us. And you can see this because technology is even becoming more feminine. And if you think about how blockchain is more transparent, all about the sharing economy, and all about fairness, it's much more nurturing, it's much more decentralized, just like a feminine consciousness. Whereas the centralized internet was a much more masculine consciousness, top down rather than sharing across. And it's amazing to watch how we start evolving into this future. But it's only the brave that will be able to take more risks because we're only here once. And if we continue doing what we've always done, we'll always get the same outcomes. So my suggestion is take more risks. We're only here once. We might as well be able to step out of our comfort zones to grow and understand what next steps are. And also remember, delayed gratification is a real thing. Just because you don't understand the first six lectures of crypto or blockchain doesn't mean you're not getting anywhere. Slowly but surely, that delayed gratification starts to add up and you become a specialist in that field that you're going into. And ultimately, remember, you never reach the top. Nobody ever reaches the top. It's a continuous process of us moving towards the future. Carol Dweck wrote a great book called The Growth Mindset, which is all about this idea of never stopping to learn. But you know what the most important thing is about the growth mindset? Is making a decision that you will seek discomfort. Making a decision that it's always important for you to be uncomfortable so you can continuously learn. And if you don't put in that decision, that discipline, you'll find yourself stuck to the past, complaining about the future, and worrying about a terrible future that we're moving into, rather than spending the time learning and putting yourself in a state of continuously understanding what the next steps are. And every successful person I have ever met always has two beliefs. This person always says, the future will be better than the past, and I have the power to make it so. And this becomes our incredible privilege of choice as human beings as we move from the fourth turning to the first turning. And Dr. Joe Dispenza also has a fantastic question. He says, are you living a life based on a set of memories from your past? Or are you living a life based on the vision of your future? And most of us, are in memory repetition. Most of us are expecting the past to be in the future, and we realize that that is not true. And if you understand anything about quantum science, you'll realize that time is not real. Time is based on Newtonian science. Quantum science has proven to us that there is no time, there's only the forever now. And in the forever now, if we drag our past with us into this future, we'll just be miserable people. And so in this process of moving towards a vision rather than your memories becomes an incredibly powerful decision we can make. And so I'll leave you with one last slide. Is as we move into this future, where we realize that everything is changing, that everything that we once trusted is imploding, the most important decision we can make is to seek discomfort. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm here to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? We do? If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. No? Great, okay.
got a question here? You have a mic? There we go. It's got a mic behind you. I would like to uh, thank you for this nice and interesting presentation. Thank you. I share the essential of your presentation, but I'm not totally agree with you. Sure. When you said observation is a passive science. Uh, sorry, say that again? I didn't hear you. I said I'm not agree. No, no, I got that part. You don't have to review that part. <laughs> I got that part. <laughs> I just didn't hear what the second part was. This is the only point. I said I'm not agree with you that observation is passive. A, a passive science. Oh, right. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, got that part. Yes. No, look, I think on a quantum level, observation is not passive at all. I agree with you 100%. On a physical level, we need to be, ex be able to experiment on those imaginations into the process. But very good point. You're right. Observation does change the reality we look at. But what I was trying to express is, when we've imagined, when we're curious to sit on the sidelines and watch things happen and not actually get involved with it with our hands physically, that is required of us to do. And many of our societal shifts or, or, or ideas is the idea that we shouldn't experiment. We should only do things for absolute outcomes, right? So thank you for the point. I agree with you. Actually, I agree with you not agreeing with me. So thank you. Okay, John, thank, thanks for the presentation. It was really amazing. Um, so for someone who has kids at the age of three and four right now, um, how do you inculcate these ideas? Because the education system is still 50 years back. Yeah. Um, when you challenge them, um, they, you know, they, they, they get discomfort. Of course. Um, so how do you, because I think as parents, when you take up this ownership, yes. so what's your, or your recommendations on yeah. bringing up our kids? It's a great question. I get this question pretty much at every talk I do. The question is, what do we do for our kids? So first thing I'll say is that we are in a transition phase. So education won't be backwards for that much longer. We will, it will eventually catch up. But we find ourselves in this transition phase, right? So the first thing is, there's a great saying that says, your actions are so loud, I can't hear a word you're saying. And so very firstly, we need to be examples for our kids to be adaptable, curious, and out there and learning new things. If we are sitting there complaining about our job, the traffic, and our boss, and then we're expecting our kids to be curious and excited about the future, that's the first challenge we have. The second challenge is, when I was growing up, I was exposed to maybe 20 adults, and the adults had maybe five different careers, right? I joked about it earlier, but when we were kids, all our parents, mothers were doctors, lawyers, engineers. I mean, there was nothing else really. So our options were limited. And so you doesn't matter if you were fascinated with gardening and technology, that wasn't a degree for you, so you had to go in to become a lawyer, right? What I suggest is our kids need to be exposed to as many different careers and businesses as possible to understand what tweaks their passion. And so, you know, you might have your son going watching football and then going to technology and then spending time with an uncle that's a lawyer, and that kid will start to pick up things that he likes and doesn't like and likes and doesn't like and eventually starts to combine all these fascination points to its, her, his own unique signature. And it's in that unique signature that we start to see a brand new sector being birthed called the creator economy. The creator economy over the last two years is made over $8 billion. And it's this creator economy that's based on singular people around the world making money based on their passion and their creativity. If you look up creator economy, you'll see that this is a growing process. And what the creator economy shows us is that being unique is your selling point. So one, be the example for your children. Two, expose them to as many things so they can pick up on their own passion. Three, don't take them out of school. That's not allowed. You'll be put into jail. So keep them in school, but make sure that at least twice a week, you're spending time talking to them about the future, about something wondrous, and also get them to ask better questions. I think schooling and the many things in our society in the past, we weren't really allowed to ask questions that didn't fit into the curriculum. You got into trouble if you asked too many big, broad questions. And so we need to get them to ask better questions. And in the process of asking better questions, really what you're doing for them is making them more curious. And so this future requires us not so much to understand what the future is going to be because everybody seems to be addicted to the need to understand. I disagree. I think what we need to do is realize that the most important thing we can manage is our behavior. 
And so how do you get them to focus on who they want to be and how they want to create that character? And in that state of character building, they now start becoming unique, and it's in that uniqueness that will be successful in the future. Thank you. Yes. Thanks very much for the presentation. It was excellent. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Of course. Firstly, uh, if you're familiar with the recent Lancet survey of 10,000 children across 10 countries, and the, the main conclusion was that the vast majority thought that the future was doomed. Yeah. They had no sense that they had any future. Right? Yes. So what do you say to children Yes. Who's, who anticipate that yes. there is really no future for them. Right. The second question is, you recall Don Rumsfeld said, you fight with the army you have, yes. not the army you wished you had. <laughs> yeah. Now, you have a workforce today, which is going to be with you for the next 20, 30 years. Poorly trained, poorly educated, yes. very few computer skills, yeah. very few digital skills. Yeah. What do you do with them? when the vast majority of research suggests that yes. it's very difficult to retrain these people. Right. Any positive questions? No. no any, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know what's funny is, that, thank you, I'm just joking. They're great questions. And, uh, I think what happens to us as human beings is when anything is uncertain, we make it scary, dark, and something that we're scared of. And we often don't realize that the uncertainty can be overcome with imagination with the opportunities to think about new things, as well as that gentleman said, when we think and observe the reality we see, it changes in front of us. So our default setting, unfortunately, as human beings, is still panic when it's uncertain. And so that's why, for me, clearing your past allows you to imagine a new future. And so these people that you're talking to most probably have horrible pasts. They haven't had great pasts. So they think that same past they come from will be their future as well, which is not true. And so first we must realize that we are moving into a future called the Zero Marginal Cost Society. I don't know if you've heard about that book by Jeremy Rifkin, global economist. Peter Diamandis talks about this as well from Singularity University. Everything that technology touches becomes almost free. We mustn't forget this as well, is that all of a sudden, most of the world will have access to all the same information. That's an incredible opportunity for us to leapfrog. So I do think that that is a tainted idea based on where they come from rather than where they're going. And this is the whole point of my talk, is that your past becomes irrelevant because you've got now access to new tool sets and new possibilities and new opportunities to want to make a different future of yourself in, the, in, in, in where we're going. So that's the first answer. And, and look, I don't think it's just poor kids that have a bad options of the future. Rich kids do as well because it's not a poverty thing it's a mindset thing you know and so if we know we all know that president that was in america he had an orange skin color he was a billionaire the ruler of the most powerful country in the world and still the biggest victim all thought the future was terrible and guess how much he came from a huge power seat so it's not even about anything to do with where you come from it's about your mindset of thinking to be like a victim and if you think like a victim you realize that you don't even really know you're thinking like a victim because you, this is the way you've been thinking for so long. It's good to complain. It's nice to be addicted to drama. So the future is terrible and that's what it's going to be. As far as the skill sets are concerned, look, that's a big problem that we're having around the world, absolutely. But also, again, we mustn't take away the fact that we have such incredible new technology arriving. Also, we have this idea that my domestic worker in South Africa, where I used to live in South Africa, had two cell phones. We're talking about somebody who lives in a very poor environment, now all of a sudden has two cell phones and has access to all the information in the world. It becomes their responsibility to want to upskill themselves. And so as human beings, it is now becoming our opportunity to stop blaming the government, blaming the past, blaming where we come from, and actually take the tool sets that are available to us that were unimaginable 50 years ago and utilize them correctly. So for me, I think we have all these challenges, but I think that our reality is a duality. We're always going to have negative and positive. We're always going to have the people that think it's terrible moving forward and moving forward in a more positive way. My mission in life is to try and get people to understand that it becomes your incredible privilege of choice and your key responsibility to evolve to where we're going rather than holding on to the past. We done?
Shukran. Thank you very much, everybody.